Good to see you. Thank you for your time. Yeah, sure. I uh, I just woke up and um, thank goodness for your yoga nidras. I went back to your um, four desires, your uh, the audio practices, and uh, the oh, yoga nice. the yoga nice. nidra in that is just exquisite. Oh, great! Yeah, so good. and even when so I'm good. wide awake, um, we've got a young baby, a little ten uh, month old. That keeps us up. Thank you very much. Yeah. And uh, I often go back to that yoga nidra, and it's just beautiful and powerful. And even when I'm wide awake, uh, when, as soon as we get to that uh, visualizing of the of the various colors of the lenses, the inner lens. Oh yeah, and, beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. It always drops me straight in. So thank you. What time are you on right now? What time is it for you? It just turned five a.m. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Wow, you look amazingly awake. So I guess it is a testament to uh, to the yoga nidra, if nothing else, yeah. your yogic life. Good. That's right. Thank you. So yeah, I wanted to ask to, just to explore that for starters. Like, I know that's a big part of your offering and where a lot of your passion mm-hmm. is. And it does feel like there's quite a need, a calling for right. yoga nidra and these more quietening... Uh, practices. Uh, it seems the yoga world was so fixated on on mm-hmm. dynamism and the sexy vinyasa, which I think it still is. Mm-hmm. But it seems mm-hmm. uh, I know a few, even just a few years ago, a lot of people in the yoga scene didn't even know what yoga nidra was, no. and That's now right. um, no. it's quite uh, quite a well known. Uh, method. And I I think Mm. you've really helped in bringing it to the forefront. So it'd be nice just to speak about that. I know. um, Sure. Yeah. Sure. Happy to. Yeah. Yeah. It is, it is a passion and I do think there's incredible need. I think as we'll talk about, I think it's a place um, where a lot of people will find a resource that they might not otherwise about getting still. And we can talk about that, you know, because while, I know a bit about your background. I know enough that that stillness and meditation and self reflection are are, are are something really you see the significance in it. But a lot of yoga students are you know wrestling with why should I and is it really important? But nonetheless, I think yoga nidra even for those people will be an entry point. Yeah. Yeah, and even on the nights where we have like a couple of hours sleep due to taking care of the little ones, uh, even just that couple of hours, if the yoga nidra is brought in, it feels the equivalent to a full night's sleep, I feel. Well, there is, there is some physiological explanations for why maybe not a full night's sleep, but certainly several hours worth. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's real. Uh, so more than happy to just talk a little bit about even there's some clinical stuff that we can you know, yeah. just touch on. Yeah, touch upon it. I think it'd be good for people to know like what's what's actually going on. Is it is it the is it hitting into the pineal gland or is it regulating melatonin and GABA and all that good stuff? Uh, all of it. Yeah, kind of all of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, far out. Beautiful. And and I know you want a little bit about yoga, a little about tantra and things like yes. that. I understand. Yeah, let's dive into tantra. So um. I think possibly uh, some of the conversations I've been having with people like yourself and Mark Whitwell and just other um, senior teachers that are practicing Tantra and have been for so for uh, quite a long mm-hmm. time, it, it seems to step on a few toes of friends of mine that are in the yoga scene and the kind of neo-Tantra scene mm-hmm. that it, it, it mm-hmm. tends to trigger some people. So I just want to put that a little side note of our conversation. So you want to trigger some people. Is that what you're telling? I do. But (laughs) but I want people to be well aware that this could trigger. And and it's all good. I don't mean any offense. I'm sure you don't either. But it does feel like some, some conversation around this is healthy because what I'm seeing a little bit of, well, quite a bit of, um, in the, in the Tantra yoga scene mm-hmm. is these Tantrikas and Dakinis and so forth stepping up into kind of master roles, admittedly mm-hmm. prematurely, like admitting mm-hmm. like, whole, like hitting the wall big time and overwhelmed and all of a sudden 
depressed, wondering why the hell have I opened up this school and this created mm-hmm. their own methodology. And, and it seems this kind of initial awakening, you could call it, or this initial movement of exaltation and bliss and erotic energy mm-hmm. and the praise that often comes with that uh, mm-hmm. in being mm-hmm. in that role um, yeah. sparks yeah. up this uh, possible premature uh, being put into the role of like master teacher prematurely without the teacher mm-hmm. having a teacher or a mentor or something like that. So it's a pretty loaded question, I guess I'm asking, but sure. uh, it's more of a conversation speaking to people feeling they're in that situation, the teacher in that situation. I can think of quite a few people that would be listening to this going, fuck, yeah, I'm overwhelmed, I'm depressed, yet I'm in this role as... Yeah. Takini as Decca as, as a master teacher. Um, so just well, speaking let's, to that. Let's a little jump bit. into that. <laughs> I mean, it is. Let's jump into that. Uh, well, just tell me. I don't even know if we've started yet. Have we started? We've started. Yes, we have. Okay, we've started. <laughs> All right. Um, well, what should we do first? Because I think the latter is um, a very. Um, it is it is an area of concern somewhat to me and from my vantage point having had a teacher having been steeped in a tradition um i i understand that the 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 natural inclination to move into these things under the and i really appreciate your languaging it as neo tantra Mm -hmm. meaning it's new tantra and um you know unfortunately Stuart, uh tantra it, it, Tantra is a term that's been misused um, and misunderstood. And, um, and in a way, it's almost like people have started, have taken that word Tantra um, and just substituted it for really um, what I call MSU. MSU stands for making shit up. Um, in essence, they're basically grabbing a little bit of information there, a little inspiration there, a kind of, it becomes this amalgam of stuff that has nothing to do with any kind of tradition. It's not steeped in any knowledge per se, um, uh, any revealed knowledge. So the first thing to suggest about Tantra is, look, there are really two uh, schools of Tantra. And one is, One school is, in essence, it sees the Vedas as revealed knowledge. And it follows that path as revealed knowledge. In other words, that there was knowledge that was actually not learned, not intellectually put together, not even drawn together from one's own sensual impulses, but it was revealed knowledge. And so the Vedas, including Sankhya philosophy, which is the basis of yoga, was seen as part of Tantra, not separate from Tantra. And when you when you begin to draw back into roots like that, what you start to do is you realize that there are fundamental developmental, there, there are fundamental stages that are required to take advantage of what Tantra ultimately is. And in the ancient tradition, you didn't just jump into the most advanced sensual practices. There was this and it's probably one of the most critical terms in Tantra that gets rarely used. And the, the term is adhikata. Adhikata means, in essence, uh, the right to know. It means the qualifications that one accumulates along the way in one's own self-development that then gives you the capacity to hold new energies, new, 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 new tools. You know, I have um, four kids and my youngest are now 10, they're twins. And now there's no big deal that they can handle a kitchen knife. It's not a big deal anymore. And, you know, I still out of the corner of my eye watch as they cut apples and things like this. But we never would have put a kitchen knife in the hand of a three-year-old or a two-year-old. And you're, you don't have a, your, your young one now is not yet walking, but there'll be a time where you'll start locking the drawers, literally, so they don't have access to certain tools. And that 
fundamental and very practical way of looking at life, looking at methodology as tools, you go, they're not all suited for everybody at every level of qualification. So that one school of Tantra says that's revealed knowledge and it holds to the orthodoxy, if you will, of right and wrong, morality, yama and niyamas, the basic things that most yoga students learn but struggle with as it is. There's another school that doesn't look at those, that, that body of knowledge as revealed. It actually looks at it as information, but not necessarily reveal knowledge and worthy of following. And that, that comes in this larger heading of forbidden, quote unquote, forbidden Tantra. Why forbidden? Because it's non-orthodox. However, the orthodoxy that is steeped in this idea that you're already, your kundalini is already awakened. You can become unorthodox if you're already in an illumined state. But if you, and I, I mean, it's really fair to just say, look, it's really tempting. The idea that you can link your spirituality with sensuality, and now all of the taboos and sad, you just rip them away and you go, well, we can, we can fornicate and we can fondle each other and we can play with these boundaries that society would look at and go, you know, that's absolutely either inappropriate or totally off the wall. It's easy to understand human nature and say that's really tempting. And now with Neo Tantra, and I, again, I appreciate that labeling because it's a kind of new age amalgam of stuff. Um, we don't know whether it's our worst inclinations or our highest inclinations that are leading us into that path. And um, so I think that's the first thing to clarify. Um, the truth is that there are very few that the this kind of forbidden, unorthodox approach to Tantra, there are the fewest authoritative teachers of that methodology in the world, period. So just because you're teaching an orthodox kind of occult sexuality slash sensuality in no way suggests you're a master of anything other than perhaps good promotion, good advertising, a good byline, a cool Instagram account where, you know, you're really plunging into this kind of sensuality in the name of spirituality. Mm. And the truth, and you, I think, addressed it is. More times than not, not, it has very little to do with spirituality. Mm -hmm. It actually is just a kind of sense of freedom and uh, experimentation. Um, and, I, and I've gone on. I've answered your question at length. But I want to just say one more thing, and then let's have Please more do. of a conversation yeah. about it. What everyone should understand about Tantra is one of the key things that Tantra says is that Whatever you want to accomplish in life, whether it's spiritual or it's mundane, whether it's non-material or material, you need power. One of the one of the um, na one of the synonyms of tantric practice is called shakti sadhana, mm -hmm. and so it's really po it's techniques and methodologies that give you power, that develop power and capacity. So what we should all take pause about is just simply understanding what is power without knowledge? Mm -hmm. When I talk about knowledge, I mean self-understanding. Power without self-understanding is dangerous. The yoga tradition, which I earlier said was part of the kind of school that says the Vedas are revealed knowledge and includes yoga and includes Sankhya, that school's emphasis before you get to Tantra is on self-knowledge. The yoga tradition is self-knowledge based. If you have self-knowledge without power, it's ineffectual. Mm -hmm. The marriage of the two is ideal. So what happens is if you have, if your power outstrips your knowledge or outpaces your knowledge, you're really putting yourself at danger mm -hmm. and whomever else you're preaching to or guiding along that path. Ultimately, we all come to these traditions and these practices not fully self-conscious. That's why we do them, is mm -hmm. to become more conscious. But if we're not fully self-aware, 
and we develop power. Without a commensurate growth, without an equal growth in our self-awareness, what happens is we become more powerfully unself-aware. Mm-hmm. And that's when the trouble begins. We now are amplifying our ignorance, or we're amplifying our neuroses, or we're amplifying our confusion, our jealousy, our manipulation, and then you run into, then you run into trouble. And, and it's the students as well start to run into trouble. Um, mm. So, I mean, I hope that without no, that overcom- did. I haven't heard it quite put like that. That was actually, um, yeah, very illuminative. Um, yeah, I hadn't quite heard that type of response, which I think is really smart and um, really highlighting that it can be dangerous. I mean, we've seen cases of depression and anxiety and even suicide occurring from these leaders in, in uh, quote-unquote leaders and, and um, masters in the field uh, claiming to be and um, mm-hmm. yeah, just amplifying those neuroses and those agonies and those struggles and kind of even the you often hear of them speak about the, the classic spiritual bypass. They're mm-hmm. totally bypassing all of this uh, shit and, um, and it, it drives them mad. And it's very interesting how um, it's challenging without having a mentor or go-to teacher to stay accountable, to stay true to that. It's so easy to override those neuroses and those delusions with our own ego constructs, our mind and kind of use spiritual languaging uh, to, to further reinforce it, I guess. And um, it, it's, very, it's very interesting and just kind of chewing on the, the, the situation I keep observing. And it, it does seem a, like a little bit of a pendulum shift from like kind of the the classical seeking methodologies, uh, the more austere practices of totally uh, giving up the world and just going within and kind of denying one's desires, denying one's attachments and kind of bypassing in that way to get to spirit. It seems almost possibly like a pendulum shift from that, that type of stillness to then this kind of dynamism and uh, indulgence that just isn't real. It isn't fulfilling. It's well, well, I mean, one of the things you, you know, you use the word and again, language is really important. Mm. Use your word early on in the conversation about exaltation, you know, people looking for ecstasy and it's easy to get a little bit um, misguided or kind of misinformed that ecstasy is the aim of tantric practice. It actually is not. Um, ecstasy is a kind of way station along the way that tells you, that get, gives you a glimpse of what? The self, actually. But, you know, ecstasy has a polarity. And you've talked about them. You've mentioned them. So they are emotional crises and they are depression and they are uh, incredibly negative thinking and self-criticism. So we can think of the opposite of ecstasy. If you, if you can think of the opposite of ecstasy, uh, which is not too hard to do, then the search for ecstasy through neo-tantra is actually setting yourself up mm-hmm. to experience its polarity. The tantrics weren't that interested from a traditional point of view, they weren't that interested in, in ecstasy as an end game. When ecstasy becomes an end game, you will also bring with you its polarities. The interesting thing, if you look at one model, uh, uh, one sub-tradition of Tantra, which is uh, the one I was schooled in, which embraces the totality of Tantra, but gives us even more understanding about its depth and its range of possibilities, which is called Sri Vidya, and in Sri Vidya, you know, this exaltation is really, uh, let's say, it's, it's the fourth level. It's, it's one aspect of this fourth level of consciousness, and there are nine. 
And so the ecstasy thing is really kind of in the middle. After ecstasy comes Mm non-duality. And after non-duality, then they have uh, four, three, four more levels because non-duality and ecstasy are both of the heart. They're heart energies, this this pumping and this pulsation and this idea of getting enthralled and moved and excited in this way. It's not the way, it's not the final end game in Tantra at all. So much more vital. And I, I, uh, before you and I spoke today, I, I had took the opportunity to listen to a couple of, I wanted to hear your, you as an interviewer. And I wanted to, I just took advantage of some people I love Octavio. I listened to your, your, conversation with him and things like that and as well as Anna Forrest who I've known as long as anyone practically in the yoga world we've probably known each other almost 40 years and Mark Whitwell who I have a lot of respect for but more than once I've heard you call out you know your child and your marriage as these grounding forces that have helped to soften you and broaden your capacity for love and generosity and inclusivity and awareness and kindness, you, that's as tantric as anything you could begin, as anything you could begin to describe, which is a lot of people are under the impression that through like some of the new neo-tantric practices, that it's an accelerated journey. It's actually not an accelerated journey. Mm. It's a more complete journey. And those are two very different things. In other words, There is no going around, going over, bypassing. That doesn't exist. You still have you. You still have to take you to that final destination and your level of integration. That's really what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Tantra is an integrational methodology where the totality, totality of me shows up in every moment. One of the meanings of the word Tantra is continuity. So great, you can get to ecstasy. There's a lot of ways to get to ecstasy and they're not all involved sexuality, by the way. You know, I mean, in some ways, extreme athletes get to uh, ecstasy, right? Push me out of an airplane at 30,000 feet. I'm gonna experience something that's gonna get me in the moment really quickly or put me on a 40 foot wave, that'll get me there. Uh, But what do I do afterwards? Who am I after that ecstasy? Tantra is interested in continuity. And that's why non-dualism, which is of this kind of fourth circuit in Sri Vidya, which more or less corresponds to the fourth or the heart chakra, that's where you're getting all this pulsation of love and feeling and being moved. But at the end of that cluster, the last of those shaktis is non-dualism, where all of this pursuing of good and bad and ecstasy and trying to move beyond the mundane, all of that just merges into a whole holism. Mm-hmm. Now, the problem, I think, comes from when you talked about tantric teachers and they run into trouble and their students are running into trouble is it's the level of realization of the teacher. As students of a teacher, especially if it any system, really, we can't exceed the teacher Mm -hmm. if we follow their discipline, their course that they themselves followed to get where they went. We are, in a way, the children of their states of consciousness. And if they're still at the mercy of the most um, human of kind of foibles and jealousies and smallness of mind and dishonesty and stuff like that, mm-hmm. how far can we go as their students? You know? um, and because in most cases of this kind of neo-tantric model, Because there's not a tradition to lean into beyond that teacher, you don't have a fallback. You know, you've got one person with a flashlight who hasn't gone very far down the road. And 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 that's so so um, so there's a bunch of a bunch of uh, kind of things to fall into or that will be a disruption in the path in one's own development, you know. And we haven't even begun to talk about drugs because a lot of these cultures that you're actually describing, there's also there's also a kind of very, um, it's pretty loose and fast with drugs. And it's almost like one more piece of delusion to throw into the mix mm-hmm. uh, on both the behalf of the teacher and the student. So um, 
Yeah, we'll touch on that in a moment. I think it's we a can... mess, you know. I it is. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Jumping ahead. Yeah, ahead. We'll, we'll jump into um into the kind of drug psychedelic plant medicine thing in a moment. Uh, I think we could keep uh, kind of unpacking the 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 tantric world bef- before that, even just the 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 practicality of the teacher student relationship. And um, again, I am quite close with a lot of these people in these roles of teaching this new kind of neo tantra mm-hmm. i'm friends with them you know and 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 some sometimes they get pissed off at me at shining the light uh on this type of conversation but that's okay that's kind of for some reason the kind of role i've stepped into it's uh it's uh, it it feels just quite uh necessary so like say for the 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 teacher listening yeah uh that again, has, has often come to me admitting like, fuck, I, I, I need a teacher. They'll like uh, just be vulnerable saying, I, I need a teacher. Like I feel lost, yet I'm, I'm the teacher. I'm like the teacher's teacher, yet I need a fucking teacher. Um, and they're, they're frustrated. They're, they're, right. I think that is a good place to be, to be honest. Like that, that, that vulnerability, that honesty, that, uh, that beginner's mind and coming back to being a student, I think is super important. So just like speaking to that teacher, maybe that younger teacher that maybe has prematurely stepped into that role and all of a sudden they're like, holy yeah. fuck, I've got this huge following all of a sudden and uh, mm-hmm. and I am just burnt out and I'm going through just growth mm-hmm. and development. A lot of them seem to be in this kind of 27 to 33 age bracket, like that set and return type uh, period where people are really finding their, um, their autonomy, their, their, their true, their, their dharma. And it can be a challenging time. And to be leaped into that role as like the teacher, uh, I'm seeing again and again, it, it's very challenging. So just speaking to that person in particular, because I know that's a lot of the listeners, um, we're lucky with all the online accessibility. They can get in touch with content like yourself and your app, the sanctuary, and that is a great thing. Do you think that is enough, or is like the in-person transmission of being with a mentor, being with a teacher, and being eye to eye? Do you think that is necessary? You know. Um because you're directing the question at teachers and those who have followers, um, I would say that it's absolutely critical that they have a teacher, a living teacher that they have contact with. Um, you know, as, as busy as I am um, and as committed as I am work-wise and writing and things like that and, and just creatively, I still make time to meet with individuals uh, all the time. And the reason for that is because I knew it played such a vital role in my life. Um, you know, if I've often t- thought about the idea of if I had just solid notebooks of how much information I got from my teacher, teachers, how much experience that they shared on a public level, I mean, it would be, you know, it would fill a lot of shelves. It would be, and and for me, I'm not I'm not really a visual learner as much as I am auditory and tactile. So I learn by experience, and I learn by hearing it. But um, moreover, the point is, I probably would never have gotten through all of those notebooks if I, you know, not received them directly. But the real um, gold in my relationship with my teachers, and I've had two uh, gurus. Um, was in meeting with them individually and them um, giving me specific guidance, not just specific practice and specific practices where they can teach me or provide methodology that's really um, initiatory where this is now lighting my lamp. I'm not, it's not the methodology that lights a million lamps or a thousand lamps, but it's my lamp. And then, and how to protect that flame. You know, one of the meanings of the word mantra, uh, it comes out of man meaning to think and tra means to protect. 
it's like receiving a mantra is a way of protecting the mind. And in the same time, it's also getting the mind to stretch. So those meetings were vital. And so what I would say is, um, first, one of the reasons teachers get lost is because they don't have a personal practice, a practice that actually is um, um, uh, suited specifically for them and their growth. Two, they don't actually have the protection and guidance of a tradition. When I initiate people, I say, I literally say, I give you this method or technique or mantra on behalf of my teacher and the sages and saints that oversee our tradition. And that's not empty. That's not an empty thought. And it's not just a kind of uh, gesture. The truth is that um, through parampara, through tradition, you're actually being connected to a lineage of wisdom, not just to me as a teacher. In fact, I think of myself as almost like, how quickly can I get out of the way? And how, how much can I not be in your way? And can you be guided by something that's bigger than both of us? That's really what tradition is about. And ultimately having an authoritative teacher who's been given, who's been almost sanctioned, who's been given the authority to do that as as a kind of, as the limbs of the tradition, you know, the tradition lives in kind of a non-material realm. So you now become the limbs and the organs of that tradition. Um, without, the, without that guidance, without that protection, and without the wisdom and transmission of tradition, you're out there flailing, right? And if what you have is not enough, then you're going to go seek maybe an astrologer. And then you're going to go see, going to go buy some uh, you know, you're going to hear something about one of your planets being off. And if you wear an emerald on your pinky finger, that somehow will take care of everything. And then you should have a pearl mala. And then it's almost like there's just you're literally just flying blind. And then, you know, you're leading people who are also relatively blind. So they don't know how confused you are. They don't even have a clear sense of how confused you are. And in a way that that makes even it. I think as a teacher, y you feel more and more like a fake and, and, and alone. Um, so there's no question in my mind there's three things. One is the linking, the linkage to a living teacher, the um, linkage to a tradition that's bigger than the teacher, and then finally a personal practice that may or may not feel good, you know, um, and and, and I, I'd add, actually add a fourth one, which is in, in, through the kind of awakening that those three first things I mentioned will provide, there has to be space for se serious self-inquiry. You know, this is a journey of self-discovery, not just empowerment and not just ecstasy. That is fundamentally a mistake to think this is a path solely of ecstasy. It, it isn't. And it's um, so so I would say to the teacher, absolutely. And find a teacher, uh, the idea of just um, um, guiding yourself. It's kind of like that saying about um, people who use themselves as an attorney, you know, the, yeah. the client who uses them, you know, has a has a fool for a client, you know. Yeah. So, no, I think that's I think great advice. So yeah, I think that is great advice. I, I also um, just reflecting upon that I think with the more modernized movement of all the different yogas and tantras um, is the, the notion that the guru is within. And, mm -hmm. you know, what's the, what's the need for an external teacher or guru or lineage if the, the guru is within, which is, a, which is an ultimate truth. Of course, it's the ultimate truth. Mm -hmm. But along that journey is all these relative truths and... and and plateaus and step backs and upheavals and it's a huge process so i think yeah the the reductive view of the ultimate view yeah the guru is within which is what you're speaking of like a masterful teacher gives you the practice gives you guidance wisdom transmission and but then ultimately hands over your autonomy again and again and again but along that journey of all the transformations and integrations and breakthroughs and breakdowns kind of need to check in with uh, the map, with the teacher, with the lineage. So I, I get where 
a lot of the teachers uh, come from. And I've been in that place as well of like, I feel great. This is amazing. Like, I don't need to check in with anyone. Again, like, it's all temporary. Life is just, it ebbs and flows. And I think in that maybe initial movement of waking up, so to speak, that initial movement does feel pretty, pretty similar to like, you know, that, that pubescent kind of teenage feeling of invincibility, of, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. of rebellious mm-hmm. kind of invincibility. I don't need to check in with anyone. This is on. Mm-hmm. And you're kind of on fire for a while. And um, it feels quite similar to that, what I'm seeing. There's like a first, uh, an initial movement where people feel empowered and whew, awake and on fire and everything's manifesting mm-hmm. quick. And then there's a there's a, a wall that most people hit, and if we don't have someone or a sangha to check in with at that moment, it, it can be really full of crisis, full of uh, depression, and really challenging to navigate by ourselves. So yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. That self inquiry, self practice, checking in with a teacher super important yeah you know i mean it's um there's so many examples in the world too of where you find people who are experts in their field or get a lot of attention or acknowledge a lot of acknowledgement in their field you know and musicians and politicians and uh, i mean it's like anything um, it just goes on and on and on but you realize that despite their mastery in a unique expression, that there's really a lack of integration on the whole. And maybe even a lot of self-destruction and, uh, and, uh, and like, you know, describe it as almost roadkill on their path. You look back and there's just uh, um, destruction along the way as they go along. I mean, one thing that young teachers should look at is the caliber of their students. I mean, how how um, how functional are their students? And how much do you depend on, on, on a following that is itself ill-informed? You know, the best teachers attract the best students. And the best students can't attract anything but a great st- teacher. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, I'm, again, I'm kind of more than halfway through my game. I've taught for 40 years. Early, early on, I was blessed to be a part of a tradition and, you know, that I can trace back centuries and centuries and centuries. And and uh, so I really got the best of guru. I got the best of being part of a living tradition. I got um, I there were lots of hard lessons, tons of really hard lessons I learned. And many, and in many ways, maybe, Stuart, that's part of the challenges that we fi- find these days. Um, you know, I, I don't want to age myself, but I will. I mean, I grew up in a time, I can remember getting my first answering machine, answering machine. When my guru was not in the United States, he was only in the United States for two, three months a year, I would send something called an airmail letter. So for the, your audience that doesn't know what that is, you actually wrote it by hand, you licked it, and you put it at the post office, and then it went across the world. Um, I mean, I remember asking him questions via airmail, right? And um, getting a response six to nine months later. Now, what happened during that six to nine months is the question kept percolating and kept percolating. And usually by the time I got an answer, I had already resolved it. I had already figured it out, you know? And, but it wasn't, it, 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 had I not written it out and had I not reached out to this person I trusted, I'm quite certain that the magic was already happening in the ether because I had done that. Mm -hmm. But the point is that in this day and age, um, a lot of people love the idea of teacher until a teacher says something they don't want to hear or doesn't respond as quickly as you want them to respond. You know, we've grown so impatient. We've grown so like um, uh, um, um, uh, immediate gratification kind of idea. Mm -hmm. And, Our tolerance for, I think our tolerance for nuance and our tolerance about being challenged and seeing that actually as part of the development that 
that is this growth thing that means I will be more integrated. I mean, you have a very nice kind of way of describing being woken up in the middle of the night by your child. But the reality is it's not easy to, to be, you know, for those first two years to lose that much sleep. Uh, and it's that it's the difficulty, if you will, if it's the hardship of it, that's making you more whole. Mm. I would argue that having the, oh, this kind of touch and go, this kind of, oh my God, this teacher is so amazing and gives me so much to, holy shit, the teachers hasn't even looked my way mm. the last three times I've seen them. They've not responded to my questions. My hand's going up. I'm asking for private time. It's not happening. Or they say something that actually, which happened to me more than once in my you know, early years as teacher, I. I wanted my teacher to be the father I didn't have, you know. Mm. I wanted them to, I wanted him to be, uh, to fill an emotional need, uh, various emotional needs that I still had. And every time I showed up, hoping that my teacher would fill my emotional needs, I got my ass kicked. I totally got my ass kicked. And only over 17 years of getting my ass kicked once or twice a year, did I start taking ownership of the parts of me that weren't whole. So that relationship wasn't just being spoon-fed spiritual wisdom and initiation and, you know, the grace of a tradition. It was also like being forced to see myself and my, my all of this, you know, delusion I had about expectations and emotional needs. And without that, I would not have matured and become who I am, you know. And um, so I would say part of the challenge is culturally we're less set up. You know, I understand you have a teacher, but I think culturally, and I mean now that this is global, I think that we're just less in that mindset that allows us to be open to all of the growth and ups and downs that is having a teacher. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and as far as like, yes, the guru is in, but let's also understand, um, let's be practical. If you understand, if you have an, an, any understanding about the reach of these traditions and what they're capable of revealing. So what we have a tendency to do is use the term reductionist. It's a great term. The idea is we have the tendency to see it from our own perspective. And we think, okay, this is what enlightenment looks like, or this is what my evolution will kind of seem like. If you think it's within reach, if you perceive it within reach, you have a misunderstanding of what it is because you will not go to that place. Mm -hmm. In other words, you don't get to take your old version of you to that place. Neem Karoli Baba existed at a level of consciousness that no one understands, only the few peers that hover on his level of consciousness, right? If you think you can get to where he was through your own devices, you don't know where he was. Mm -hmm. And that's true for higher consciousness in general, but especially when we speak about the lineages and the masters who have had these states of realization, we don't have a clue. Most people are completely clueless. So what we do is we reduce enlightenment to a kind of rosy picture of what my life would look like. And we assume that's there. And then we go, well, I can kind of probably get there if I practice enough Kundalini yoga, if I you know, now start filling in the blank. I create a sensual system around sexuality and mm. polarity and I push envelopes and I get risky and we light a fire and we light incense and we do this and do that. Then yes, but you're really playing with matches in, in, in a game that's about rocket science. Well put, <laughs> well put. <laughs> and again, the, the guru within implies that your kundalini has been awakened. Your sashumna nadi is clear, doesn't it? Similar to um, looking looking for happiness through through external measures, or 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 even going further than that, looking for happiness within. It, it's a similar exploration. It implies that that our kundalini has been awakened and our sashumna nadi is clear. Um, so it's, 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 it's a deep process of, of uncovering. You, you, know, Stu, you know, Stuart, my first teacher said something to me that I spent, um, I've spent many decades resisting. 
And he said to me, the Tantra will never be popular. Mm. And that it's not a, it's not for the common man. Mm. And I really resisted that idea. Um, I felt it touched my life so profoundly and I didn't really see myself as exceptional. I felt like I was in every, I was, I was, there was an every man or every person in me and every person wanted what I was experiencing through those practices. But as time has passed, as the decades have passed, I realized he was right. And what you spoke to when you talked about reductionism is I actually really feel that there are a lot of sensualists who are actually pursuing a quote unquote spiritual path, but fundamentally they're driven by sensuality. They're driven by wanting to feel good. They're driven by the 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 pleasure and now we light it up with neo tantra and you throw sexuality involved and you go fundamentally a lot of yoga students are actually sensualists and that's why it's about having an organic yoga mat uh you know make sure you get your organic quinoa for lunch um you get all of these nice things um the right clothing women will have a you know a lovely cachet of bindis that they put on their point between their eyebrows at the right time for cool outfit spiritual materialism there you go yeah but when it comes to the really searching and stopping and, and in a way really truly prioritizing this dismantling of all of your misunderstanding and sitting for practicing self-practice for several hours a day, not to the beats of, not to cool beats, but actually deep internal practice mm -hmm. that consistently is rooted in tapas, consistently is changing you and heating you up. They're far and few between, my friend. I agree. And they're far and few between. And I think it's, it's, it's totally okay to have the sensualists mm -hmm. in, in the yoga world. But then what happens is I think the authentic seekers who's, who deeply feel this, it's either spirituality or bust. Sensuality is mm -hmm. nice, but it's spirituality or bust. It gets confusing for them. But they're, they're the rarity. Yeah, I hear you and I agree. I'm also hearing from a lot of younger yoga teachers like, what the fuck are you guys taking it so seriously for? Just go to a hip hop yoga class and just have fun and celebrate life. And I'm hearing that as well. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to be, I'm trying to hear it, you know, and hear yeah. their vantage point and truly like listen from that perspective because uh, I've been there as well and I feel I'm kind of, in the middle right now of, of like hearing that and appreciating that at the same time, it's nothing quite like deep, earnest, sincere connection he, and, he, and silence. He, yeah. yeah. Here's what I would say, you know, four decades in the game later, here's what I would say mm -hmm. is just, just let time pass because that, you don't have to be in judgment. First of all, it's a great thing to let go of the judgment and and to let people have their fun. It really is. And and to not have to control their game and all that kind of stuff. But what will happen is that has a half-life. Um, it's cool if you're doing it, I think you said late 20s, early 30s. It's okay to do it in your 40s. It's really not very graceful to see people doing that in their 60s. <laughs> it's really not. They don't age well. And... Um, and, and, and it'll fall by the wayside. It'll either become drugs mm. or it'll become, it'll just fall by the wayside. It'll become something else altogether. The payoff is just not big enough mm -hmm. for it to last for 30 or 40, uh, three or four decades. It just isn't. So you just go have fun. You're in your twenties and thirties, mm -hmm. you know, and do it. I mean, it. I don't, I really don't have a, I don't have a thing about it. Um, I just, I just get concerned or, you know, when I, feel disappointed or restless about it is when the word tantra is used to describe right. something it isn't right and and that's just that's just a misappropriation of of something that really has a meaning and has ancient roots but if you call it something else hmm. i don't have a problem well and same with yoga like a lot of so many things get uh diluted into a different meaning i mean look at the word yeah. 
God, look at the word yoga. I mean, mo- the word enlightenment is mass confused. A lot of modern seekers uh, are yeah. totally allergic to the word enlightenment and are throwing that out. So it, I think a lot of these big ultimate words that ca- we can't quite wrap our thinking mind around, we yeah. again, we reduce it to something much simpler yeah. or we get allergic to it and totally reject it like yeah. God and yeah. enlightenment, you know? <laughs> but, you know, you won't, there's no way to hold that tidal wave back, uh, that tidal wave of human nature, which says, I just like to have fun. Right. I want to have fun. I want to celebrate. I don't want to take things seriously. And I, all I can say is, yeah, go for it. Yeah, and then, great. you know, Stuart, you just stick to what is authentic and you share, for instance, through this means, uh, through this medium and podcasting and sharing this. And you're just giving people choices mm-hmm. and just giving people an opportunity to reflect. But at the same time, you don't carry the weight of the fact that people are making these choices that you don't feel necessarily are as authentic as authentic as they could be. And as I said, just wait, because in two, three decades, the, the, you know, eventually the truth will be revealed and, and uh, people will actually have an epiphany and change direction or, as I said, they won't age well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, finding the bliss in the mundane has been something that since becoming a parent, I've that's been a part of my practice, yoga in the household, yoga in relationship. And there seems to be an, aver- an aversion to the mundane in the, in the modernized tantra, the modernized yoga, and the plant medicine world that we haven't really delved into yet. And I literally often hear like, I'm kind of paraphrasing, but th- things along the lines of like uh, out out with the mundane, like fuck the mundane. Let's, mm-hmm. let's get mm-hmm. wild. Let's, let's explore um, beyond the mundane. Yet I've found since having kids and just practicing to integrate yoga, tantra into family life, bhakti, the mundane has become more blissful than, mm-hmm. and I've done plant medicine. I've done LSD. I've, I've I did drugs when I was very young, uh, teenage years, and and thought I was exploring the realms of bliss and God and supreme reality. And it was in a way, it was in a way, but there was the 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 withdrawals, the downfall, the the unhealthiness, the addictive, uh, the addiction. And um, what I've found after like really intentionalizing, like bringing yoga, bringing all this into the mundane is it's so much more blissful than any of those brief exalted states. But it it, it, it takes work. It takes consistency and revisiting and and a daily practice that feels way different to a brief high, a brief exalted state. If it feels way different, it is harder, but it, it feels much more blissful. You know, I would look at it a little bit differently. Mm-hmm. And I would tell you there is no mundane. Right. There is no spirituality in mundane. Yeah. I mean, I, God bless these folks whom you're describing, but sooner or later, they're going to have to go to the bathroom. And, and sooner or later, hopefully the plumbing is working. And sooner or later, they're going to wipe their ass. And sooner or later, they're going to get hungry. And sooner or later, they're going to have to earn a living. And sooner or later, the, you know. So the point is, there is no escaping what I think we're calling mundane. That's an illusion. That's, that's already the idea that you're separating something that's deeply ecstatic and, uh, and you know, uh, sublime and out there and saying, that's all I want. I don't want any of that. Well, sooner or later, they're going to want their avocado toast, you know? Um, and sooner or later, they're going to, um, it's going to come out the other end of their body. And sooner or later, so there is no, I mean, that actually suggests there is a lack of awakening mm-hmm. in someone who says, I just want that. I don't want that. I, and, and that is the opposite of Tantra. Mm-hmm. So that's really making stuff up as you go along. That's just making it up. Um, this idea that something is mundane and something is spiritual is not 
you can't find that in any tantric text at all. The whole idea is that Shiva and Shakti are constantly alive in this dance. And it's not just the Shiva thing of being in the cave. And it's not just the Shakti thing, which is just the endless arms and legs of becomingness. You know, it's not just that, it's the marriage of the two. And if you try and separate the two, their inauspiciousness is gonna meet you very quickly. Um, so, you know, some, some tantric traditions would say Shiva's in the world and some would say Shakti sits above him and others say it's the other way around. The point is that trying to separate what you're going to experience, what you want to experience from what you don't want to experience is actually, you are now down at the very base of existence. You're back down to first and second chakra and it's about as unawakened as one could possibly be because you're not even acknowledging the blessing that is your good food, your good company, your toilet working, your kitchen working, having a flame in your home, having a comfortable bed. That's grace when you just see it everywhere. So the idea that you reject half of existence, you know, that's, that's a really small world. Mm -hmm. It's not a bigger world, it's a much smaller world. Uh, so the awakened mind sees it all as one thing. It's all a dance of Shiva and Shakti. And um, I, 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 wish, I wish those people luck, you know, yes. who are just trying to live for the spiritual and not the mundane. Yeah, and most of the world traditions have a way of reminding us of that. Samsara is Nirvana, for example, and it's, it's all... It's all the same thing. It's all part of it. Yeah. I get it, yeah. it's a huge shift. It's a huge shift again from that 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 samsaric rat race of yo-yoing from high to low, from positive to negative. It's a big shift. Uh, with, and that's a seductive trip, you know, like in a lot of places in the world, including where I'm living in Perth, that's the kind of as Ken Welber would put it, like the center of gravity, like the the, um, the predominant state of being from yo-yoing from a brief superficial state of positivity to then mm -hmm. a shitty state of negativity. And <laughs> of course, we're going to attempt to push away the negativity to try to grasp mm -hmm. onto a, a false sense of positivity. And that's just, that's the trip of um, a lot of places in the world, um, and it, it does have a seductive, like gravity type magnetism to it to just fall back into the rat race. So I think that's where, once again, a, a disciplined practice of finding a deeper uh, integrated happiness, a deeper integrated awareness, rather than just leaving the exalted state, the bliss in the ecstatic dance, in the plant medicine ceremony, in the in the class, as opposed to integrating mm -hmm. it into into the negative stuff, which is a part of life. I would just again offer mm. anyone in your audience who's kind of subscribing to tantra uh, that if if you're leaning into the, the the worldview that you just described, Stuart, where it's you know it's about push away material existence, attract mm -hmm. to the sublime existence. Um, you are not, you are not practicing Tantra. Mm -hmm. That is not Tantra. Not at all. Not what, not, not, not at all. And they're also being disingenuous. Mm -hmm. They're actually being intellectually dishonest because um, they're actually as reliant on the mundane stuff. I mean, can you imagine being, and I hate to be this um, kind of mundane, but can you imagine being constipated? And like having and tripping, like you haven't you haven't tripping, gone to the bathroom like in tripping time. over or tripping on acid. Like no tripping with um, ayahuasca <laughs> right, or whatnot. Right, right. So now you're tripping about your constipation, right? So if you don't go to the bathroom four or five days, I mean, how much more mundane does it get? And if you don't do that, and you're yet you know you want to go into the sublime realms, you're not going to go into the sublime realms. Your your colon's not working. So we're all part of that game. No matter how much you want to deny it, um, you're still part of the game. So you, you just can't, you can't hide from the fact you still have a human body and a human existence. Um, so, um, 
So I, I would just caution anyone who subscribe and who, who say they subscribe to a tantric view and kind of is this idea of like, you're trying to parse the universe into two. That is not tantra. Mm-hmm. Now, Spiritual and mundane is, is a separation. I mean, I would tell you that the whole case for what tantric practice is meant to accomplish is that you tear down that wall mm-hmm. that is this appearance of separation. And the more you do that, the more you're actually living tantrically. And the more you see your spirituality in your mon- mundane life and your mundane life and your spirituality, that's Tantra. Yeah. Um, and I've studied with two masters and they epitomize that. They were ecstatic whether they were, uh, we were gardening or we were meditating. Whether we were talking in about uh, the most subtle aspects of divinity or politics. Same state of ecstasy, same fluidity, same joyousness, same spontaneity, you know. So, man, you know, once you start separating the universe into halves, Mm -hmm. into the attractive and the unattractive, then you're as much, you're living as confined a life as a lot of the people we judge who are simply workers, Mm -hmm. you know, doing their thing. Yeah. Yeah. We have, um, we've touched upon the, 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 the drug kind of plant medicine realms. I think it'd be good just to t- get in there a little bit more uh, and then we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll bring it full circle and wrap it up in a nice way. But um, again, there, there are some destructive things going on in the, in the quote unquote plant medicine world. And I, I've, I've been in it and I, I have explored different plant medicines myself and I have felt benefits of it, but we, over time, the discernment of it has been amplified, been magnified big time. Uh, it's been some years now since I have uh, explored plant medicines. And um, I am thankful that I did. But coming out the other side and just observing the kind of scene since I was kind of in it, it's become very popularized and very... Um, I think in a lot of ways kind of exploited in a, in a similar way to Tantra, but it's a whole nother slippery ball game, uh, which can be quite, um, quite dangerous. And the lack of discernment around who should have it and who shouldn't. Um, yeah, again, quite dangerous. And I've seen people really um, go mad, go, go mm-hmm. literally mad on it. And, a few years ago when I was kind of just in it, I would have defended my stance and said, no, they're just in process. Their kundalini is just awakening. They're just, they're, they're communing with the, the, the teacher and, um, and they're just in process. But now just like zooming out a bit more and, and observing the, the more negative aspects of what I've observed in the plant medicine community and, and all of that, it, it seems just very apparent the amount of discernment and intelligence when people are using it. I'd like to just get your viewpoint on it. Is it at all necessary on the tantric yoga practice? Do you think it's just an absolute no game? Like what the hell is it doing here? What's your current view? Oh, well, first let me preface it by saying no matter what I say, the people who are into it will be into it. Mm -hmm. Um, so really it's just, just an opportunity to put some things out there that maybe, maybe someone who's questioning it or, um, either considering walking away from it or whether or not to move into it. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't have any sense that I'll convince anyone to do anything one way or the other. Um, so, you know, I, I would, I would, um, support the idea that, you said I did it one time. I'm glad I did it. There was some value in it. I walked away from it. I mean, there's a few things. One is um, the the I, oh, wow. There's a few things. I mean, it's such a big it's such a big deal. And, it is. You know, in all honesty, I do think that the normalization of it is is a little bit of a concern to me, and that is that. It's now been, um, it's part of yoga culture 
in as much as from what I get in the States, at least, especially on the coasts, but there's this big thing. It's almost like it's just part of yoga. It's just, it is, if you're doing yoga, you should just be open to this because it's part of this amplifies whatever you're getting out of yoga. This is going to amplify it and, and good luck doing yoga without it, you know, uh, because it's not going to, you're not going to go as far. You're not going to get the insights or the experiences that, that, you know, so that you would otherwise, that you, you need to get for yoga to be fully what it is. Which so, I can relate to, just to interrupt you. I can re- I, I've had that perspective before. So just, which, is, which is what? If you don't do it, you're not going to get as much out of yoga as you Yeah, because I did have profound experiences. And for me at the time, it did feel like a yoga practice that was just, uh, yeah, amplified using your word. Um, it did. But now maturing from that, integrating from that, zooming out a little bit more, um, that was a deluded idea. It, it was. Um, I think it can be used skillfully with the right... I think it should be... If it's going to be used, I think it should be used like one-on-one with a very skilled... Either it be a therapist or a very skilled... Like kind of like the, mm-hmm. the MDMA that's arising and the psilocybin, mm-hmm. like being used in a very skilled psychotherapeutic... Mm-hmm. Um, Almost, almost like teacher disciple type mode. That, that's my viewpoint on it now. That was a big interruption, but I can hear that vantage point of, yeah, without it, your yoga practice is shit. Now I think that's bull crap. <laughs> well, well, but let's, let's step back for a second yeah. because I think the number one thing to say is, look, earlier in our conversation, we had, you know, you asked me a question about teachers and, you know, what do teachers do when they're kind of in a crisis mode or kind of reached a, a plateau or something like that and really questioning themselves. I would argue that the first thing we have to do is reflect on the yoga practice itself. How much is it providing? Now, the reality is that what has come, what is now under the name of yoga is it's all bets off, you know, is it with music? Is it without music? Is it with massage? Is it with this? Is it with goats? Is it with beer? Is it with that? Is it with this? And it all kind of is swept up into the yoga. And so now the question is, well, what is that? What is, what are you actually getting out of your yoga? Okay. So now if you're not actually progressing systematically toward samadhi, and I'm using the word not, I'm using the word in a technical context, which is that in essence, what samadhi means is that whatever you bring your attention to, you have understanding of. Just let's stop there for a second. Yeah. Yoga is, the, is, it's really samadhi yoga. It's the process where when I bring attention to something, I understand it. There's no confusion whether that's my teenager or what I want to do for my career or about love or about sex or about creativity, I understand it because I'm absorbed in it. And I would argue that 90 some odd percent of the yoga we're doing isn't Samadhi yoga. It's asana. So now let's look at the reality. If I do that for 10 or 15 or 20 years, and I don't actually have much more understanding than I used to have about whenever I bring my attention to something. Because samadhi, by the way, is a power. It has less to do with the object than it does your capacity to, con- to direct your thoughts in a, in a specific direction, in a specific way that the self-luminous part of you comes out and brings that thing to life. So that means that whatever I pay attention to, I understand it. If that's not happening 10, 15 years down the line, and meanwhile I read these very sublime texts or I hear a good teacher lecturing about the potential of yoga and I realize, man, I'm not really scoring many points along the way. Hell yeah, hand, hand the, hand. you say this is gonna help me get there. The yeah. interest for that is a statement that my yoga is not productive. It's not steeped in a systematic approach that leads me toward greater levels of samadhi. So no wonder it's tempting and no wonder it's part of a culture because it's part of a culture that's not getting very much out of its yoga. Mm -hmm. 
someone who's gotten a lot out of their yoga, the idea of saying to the Dalai Lama, your holiness, I understand, you know, you've been practicing and you meditate four hours a day, but here's some ayahuasca, your holiness. It'll help. It's a ludicrous idea. It's a ludicrous idea to hand it to my teacher who meditates for about the same period of time. And to spend time with him is to know that he communes on levels that are beyond our comprehension. And in having meditated for 40 years, I can tell you the last 10 have been really revelatory. And the idea that I need some ayahuasca to help me push that trip further along or push the experience further along is absurd. I don't need help. But so the empathetic part of me says, no wonder there's a lot of people doing a kind of yoga that doesn't really elevate their consciousness in a meaningful way. So that's why those things start becoming viable alternatives or supplements, right? But the first thing we have to do is go, where's the organic? Where's the disconnect? Because here's the deal. The Dalai Lama didn't get any parts to his consciousness that you didn't get and that I didn't get and that anyone else didn't get. The Buddha, same pieces, same everything. He doesn't have any, his instrument's not different than anyone else's instrument. We all have the same instrument. Some people have used that instrument in such a way as to move them closer to this, to this uh, revelation called Samadhi. Now what happens is when I do a drug a few times, it's not a big deal. It's not a really big deal. But the first thing I would say is there's a big difference where now you can object small mind that you've been living with. And now the drug and begins to do some amplify and then sedate certain parts of your brains and, and other parts of your brains now are, uh, are, are going full blast and other parts are totally sedated. So now you can objectify the way you've been thinking. By the way, that's not samadhi. That's not samadhi. It's called insight. Mm -hmm. It's actually called vichara or vitarka, excuse me, where now you can actually have insight about your own mind. That's not samadhi. That's considered to be like vitarka is like the lowest le ebb of meditative shift. Oh, look, look how busy my mind is. That's called vitarka. So it's like, it's not even samadhi. So as a result, what happens is we get insights, but that's not that's not the journey of yoga. It's not the journey of towards samadhi, but they are powerful. They do help us begin to see small things here or there. But what happens if now I get those insights when I do the drugs, they kind of vanish. They're not, in, they're not with me all the time. They're not with me in my marriage or they're not with me at work or they're not with me in my lack of creativity and success and fulfillment in my career. Then I go, well, I need, I need, I need to go get my shaman. I need my shaman and I need my dose, you know? And then what happens is after just a few times, we now fundamentally are saying this to ourselves is my instrument is not enough. And every time I do the drug, I reinforce the idea that my instrument is somehow incapable of making, uh, of, of bringing this magic to life or bringing life to magic or bringing magic to life. And then, and I'm not talking about chemical dependency or I'm talking about a deep psychic dependency. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking psychological dependency. Now what happens, and that's destructive. You are, each of us, each of your listeners is the Buddha, potentially. And to keep re-enlisting something that tells you you're not the Buddha, you don't have everything at your at your your inner chemistry, not everything's available to you otherwise, unless you take this thing to get to that place of insight. And again, I say insight is a small measure of samadhi. Mm -hmm. So it's actually destructive in that sense, because now we're really saying I'm not enough. I don't have what I don't have, you know, the God somehow i they skipped me or I was, I am not in the image or I'm not, I don't have this divine aspect within me that I can reach. Mm through my own devices. Uh, and then what I would also say is that there is distortions that occur in a lot of the psychic, strong psych psychoactive drugs 
that then begin to impair your capacity in the future to move towards samadhi. My first teacher, long before this was, this was a culture, this was the 1980s, clearly there was LSD and acid were around and, you know, shrooms and those things, but there was no culture of it other than, it wasn't, anyway, it was just, it wasn't the mishmash, mishmash, the mashup that it is now. And he told me at the time, he said that alcohol is worse for your physical body, but psychoactive drugs are the worst for your psyche. And he, what he said is they put holes in your psyche that then become the domain of entities. And I know I'm talking in kind of a strange language, but in Tantra, they believe that there are these other levels of consciousness. Some are lower than our level, than the human form. You want to talk about the mundane? This is the mundane with hooks in it. Mm. And those forces actually fill those holes when you do psychic, when you do uh, psychoactive drugs. So this was way back when. So there's, there's actually an impairment that begins to happen, a, a desensitization and kind of a dullness of your acuity mm. over time that the drugs now make it less likely that you can get there to samadhi because now you're actually impairing the, the vehicle to get you there. So, there's, so that's the bad news. And I can go on and on. But let me just say one thing. And, and, and that is in defense of people who are doing it. I truly believe that there's so much disruption in the things required to have the quality of mind that can get us to Samadhi in the, in the present day. It's, you know, there's no question now about the fact we're rewiring our brains thanks to these things, thanks to smartphones. Um, our brains are being rewired. Mm -hmm. And I would make the case that it's rewiring it in such a way that some things are now more, co more possible. Kids can, who play video games have a kind of mental acuity for video games that we didn't, that brains didn't show 10 or 20 years ago. But in terms of actual spiritual development, I believe it's impairing our brains. Mm -hmm. One, because of its powerful disruption in our memory our ability to sustain attention and concentration, which is the basis for progressing in meditation. And so what I would say is in defense of the temptation or the inclination to do drugs, I get it that people don't feel like their progress to samadhi, even those for those willing to do it and practicing authentic yoga, is almost at an all time low. Mm -hmm. It's like, we're just, we're just, annihilating our capacity to do it because of how distracted we are. So now it becomes even more like, and drugs become because of how much we're impairing our brains, not through drugs themselves, but actually through smartphones. Mm. So in some ways I see, I see like, oh man, Samadhi just doesn't feel like I'm ever going to get there. So now people are looking for how the hell do I get there? And that's where we started the conversation, Stuart, Yoga Nidra. Um, you know, you asked why it works. The short answer is it takes you into stage three non-REM sleep, which is the deep sleep, which we only get about 20 minutes of per night. You sleep for eight hours, and most people don't, but if you, let's say you sleep eight hours, you only get about 20 minutes of this golden symphonic harmonization of the brain and the endocrine system. Scientists were amazed. The old days, they thought like when you got to deep non uh, deep dreamless sleep, that it was going to be this inert condition of actual, you know, you were in this slow wave brainwave, slow brainwave. But scientists thought it was almost like akin to almost a coma where nothing was going on in the brain. And now because the instruments have changed in their measurements, what they're actually finding, it's the opposite. It's when all of the brain begins to cohere. Mm. And now there's this amazing unifying potential at, this unifying field of symphonic um, um, harmonization that's going on between all the parts of the brain. And now the hormones are being released and we can go on and on and on. But the bottom line is that yoga nidra actually gets us to a kind of stage of samadhi. But instead of having to sit up, instead of having to develop it slowly over years where you can hold attention in an unbroken way for a long period of time through concentration, 
Yoga Nidra invites you to lie down and relax your way into that coherence. And instead of being fragmented, which is what our current culture and technology is doing to us, it's actually instilling unification. And now the systems of the body, as I said, our endocrine system, our brain, our nervous system, our parasympathetic nervous system, all these things are starting to fire. And I actually think that, you know, samadhi is going to be less within the reach of more and more people. But Yoga Nidra, because of its exploding popularity, and people are seeking out, you said like 10 years ago, no one even heard of it practically. Um, I just into samadhi. I think for, for a lot of people. And really one way it's defined is yoga nidra is the intersection of samadhi and sleep. Hmm. Well, that was a long thing. We went from drugs to yoga nidra. I just wanted to end on a little bit on a positive note. Totally. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I really appreciate your honest sharings on the, on the drugs. Um, yeah, the, there's huge debate in the community and it, people are um, emphasizing the, the, polarity to that of no the if it's a plant medicine if it's a plant medicine it's actually making your brain more sharp it's actually opening up your nadis uh, so it's just it's interesting to get all the different perspectives and hear everyone out but i do, really do respect um the amount of knowledge you have behind it and the conviction and i feel it mm. and i'm feeling it in my experience and my body as well and i think it's really important to to have conscious conversation around it rather than just mm -hmm. debating debating bad it's good getting down to the actual experiential facts and um it's still such a new phenomenon in the in our culture mm -hmm. for people to be doing it in the way that they're doing it um, mm -hmm. and the doses that they're doing it and the, the, the commonality of there being a lack of integration and a lack of a practice to, to bring whatever was cultivated into life. So it's, it's just a very new, new domain, which, um, I think it's healthy to have a, a, a level conscious conversation around. So I really appreciate it. Good, yeah. good, good, good. And I, I really do think, though, that, the, again, the case, you know, I made the case about what yoga is yeah. and the fact these things become more viable in our perception when after 10 or 15 years of practicing yoga, we're not really experiencing um, more freedom. Yes. We're basically more flexible, carrying similar problems as always. We don't feel, we don't have this vibrant experience of, man, when I think about something, I understand it. You know, that's really what these yogis were talking about. And I would just caution, you know, for the, I would caution that people seek understanding of what enlightenment really was. Patanjali defined it and different texts actually describe it. It's not insight. It's not like, oh, I saw my mind or I saw this, or I saw there was love everywhere. That's not, that's not what they're talking about. You know, and it's it it is it's an it, there are very distinct endowments that don't dissipate after you've come off the drug, mm -hmm. for example. They're endowments that stay with you, and 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 you know, um, it it is new, Stuart, but it's not new. No, and um, you know, soma was is talked about in the text. It's mentioned in the Rig Veda. Um, but what I learned, and first I read it in a, in a new commentary. And I read that about a thousand years ago, the technology of how to use Soma, and by the way, it was really technical. Um, the Yazur Vader uh, later gives us descriptions about how to use it, but it's specific to phases of the moon. It's specific to your doshas. It's specific to time of life season, all of these things were thought of in this large understanding of when these things would be introduced to consciousness. It wasn't like, well, I'm free this Friday night and we've got some doses sitting around, you know. Uh, um, but what I read in a modern commentary was that the, that technology got thrown out, that it was always written in what's called twilight language, which you couldn't decipher unless you were an initiate, an initiate and you could then put the things together and get what they're actually symbolically referring to. And I, I then I took it to my teacher, 
um, who's as authoritative a teacher in the world as I, as I've ever met, authority on the text and the scriptures. And he said, that's right, Rod, about a thousand years ago, the sages realized it was being misused. So everything now is kind of being made up. And exactly as you said, it's new. It's new in as much as we don't have, at least in the yogic tradition, we don't have scriptures that actually lay out the alchemy and the formulas as we do for many, many, many other things that create, that we see real results in. Um, so, um, Yes, it's new, but it's it's only new because people are now scratching without any real traditional mm-hmm. sources to give them guidance about those methodologies. Yeah, I like how you substantiated the um, the, the the soma because a lot of yogis uh, legitimize their use of psychedelics by referring back to the the rishis uh, using soma and. Um, but just like you said, they had a real uh, ritual behind it, a real sophisticated methodology behind using it. Completely different ball game. Totally ball, different yeah. ball. Game. But yeah, the Yoga Nidra again. I can't thank you enough for being one of the main uh, impetuses for being that, bringing that into my life. Uh, thankfully, mm-hmm. I've also got my wife Jo, who's a beautiful. Uh, she's great at, at, at transmitting yoga nidra. And um, so mm. listening to your audios and her as well, it, it's a real blessing because um, the time on the mat is, is, it's undeniably, it's a bit more limited with a little uh, little baby. It's still there, but um, yeah. it's, it's more limited. It's, it's a bit more spontaneous for me these days. But having that, right. that go-to of yoga nidra is just, uh, it's vital. And, it, and like you said, with the smartphone, as all this technology continues to go the way it's going and our... Yeah you know, all of our chemistry is getting confused and overloaded. It just feels so vital, so important to, yeah. to connect with that type of technology. So yeah, thank you for Agreed. bringing that Beautiful. forth. And um, yeah, listeners, I highly encourage you, you get onto Rod's uh, The Sanctuary app and onto Para Yoga. And yeah, it, it, you're very accessible online now, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, yeah, it is. I, I kind of went a little bit kicking and screaming uh, to it. I was resistant <laughs> to, I wasn't sure what could be transmitted online. And then, you know, I, I, I quickly realized in my travels that people were getting um, not just methodology, but they were getting transmission. And uh, so it's pretty extraordinary. And, you know, I'm going to be in Australia this year. Um, I'm going to come visit after Bali and the, doing this festival over in um in jarvis bay I think. oh great yeah so i'm looking forward to i love the aussies i really do I'm yeah really we love, love you too it'd be great to uh get you over to the west coast as well someday where uh yeah we're very cl- very close to bali where the, the, right. bali is the closest uh flight from us i understand that yeah. how long is that flight by just, the way? Uh, just three there. hours i was just there a couple weeks okay. ago yeah Nice, mm. nice, 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 nice. But nice. thank you so much Good. for your time, Yoga Rupa. Really great to connect. Thank you for your wisdom and all that you bring forth. I really deeply appreciate it. All right, Stuart. Yeah. Much love. Oh, that last bit I broke wanted up. I wanted to help <laughs> push yoga into ground. I will just thank, I was just thanking you for um, your desire to push yoga forward and, and, uh, and bring some authenticity to the conversation of what it can be and what it will be. So thanks a lot, Stuart. Thank you, Rod. Much love. Much love.